Hello, everyone, and welcome to the latest installment of HDYO's Breaking Down Barriers program. As a reminder, these videos are really designed to help break down the many bar barriers around Huntington's disease, whether that's research, educational, social, in order to really help empower young people impacted by Huntington's disease. I'm thrilled to be able to have two amazing leaders in HD research join me, some of the team members from HD Buzz. I have Leora Fox and Rachel Harding. So I would love to have you all introduce yourselves and I'll start off with Leora. Thanks so much for having us. Um, it's it's great to be here. Uh, HDO does really fantastic work in the space and it's great to be able to chat with you all today. Thanks, Jenna. Um, so yeah, I'm Leora Fox. I am the Assistant Director of Research and Patient Engagement at the Huntington's Disease Society of America. And we provide all sorts of support and resources for families with Huntington's disease all over the US. Um, I'm on the research side of the organization and I oversee our research programs. We fund research, we uh, help to bring family voices into the drug development process and we communicate about research. So I'm really passionate about you know trying to help people understand what's going on with the science. Um, yeah, my background is in HD research and um, came to HDSA about six and a half years ago at this point. Wow. I'll pass it to Rachel. I can't believe it's been that long, Leora. Um, all right, so yeah, my name is Rachel Harding and I'm a principal investigator at um, a research institute called the Structural Genomics Consortium, which is a bit of a mouthful. Um, and I'm an assistant professor at the University of Toronto as well. So I wear those two hats. Um, and my lab is all focused on understanding the hunting tin protein itself, um, what it looks like, how it works, and um, how that might change in folks who have Huntington's disease. Um, and then the third hat that I wear is um, uh, HD Buzz, where I work with Leora and Sarah, who unfortunately can't join us today, um, and Ed and Jeff. Um, and I write and edit articles, um, live tweets to the best of my ability at patient conferences and other bits and pieces and uh very grateful that leora is around to you know tidy up all my writing um, and try and get things communicated to all of you folks as quickly as possible as things are happening and there's a lot happening right now so it's exciting times absolutely, absolutely. yeah thanks so much for being here you both and i'm just curious what made you decide to focus on huntington's disease so I can go way back to high school and middle school when I did a lot of volunteer work at um, at, at nursing homes, at long-term care facilities. And so I was part of a performance troupe and we would perform at different places around upstate New York where I'm from. And we, so I was kind of aware of a lot of different uh, neurodegenerative diseases. Um, I went into college and then you know, beyond uh, thinking that I would study Alzheimer's disease in graduate school, I connected with a fantastic professor, Dr. Ai Yamamoto, who was studying Huntington's and just really got sucked into the research community. And from there into the family community, it's really just a unique um, kind of crosstalk between, um, you know, in rare disease communities, there's just a lot of uh, back and forth between families and researchers and um, that's, yeah. So people ask me, you know, do you have a personal connection? And I didn't, but after you know, more than a dozen years in this space, I really do now have, you know, dear friends, um, who are affected and, um, yeah, I've been with HDSA for about half of that. So yeah, pass it to Rachel. Yeah. I think, um, when I started my postdoctoral studies, um, when I moved to Toronto, uh, we, it was around the same time that um, an organization called the CHDI, which a lot of folks in this space are familiar with, that a big funder of HD research, um, has been in touch with the organization I work for and wants us to get started on a few projects. Um, and I remember going to my first uh, CHDI meeting probably in 2015, and I met Marcy McDonald, who is obviously a very amazing female HD researcher. And she told me that once you start working on this, you won't be able to leave because it's just so interesting and it's such an amazing community. And she was exactly right because um, 
I definitely caught the HD research bug and, um, you know, it's such an interesting problem from a scientific perspective, like understanding why this very, very small change can lead to such a cascade of effects and, you know, you know, the horrible disease that we know Huntington's is, but what kind of kept me wanting to research this is like the community of folks who are involved in this. And, you know, I work in a, a space where a lot of people are specializing in all sorts of different diseases, but um, no one that I know who works in the kind of rare disease space has the opportunities to connect with, you know, patients and, you know, advocacy organizations and clinicians and genetic counselors and scientists and people in pharmaceutical companies, like all coming together into the same space to try and solve a big problem. And, you know, I think that's something that I'm really excited about being um, working on HD. Yeah, I agree with both of you. I did not have a personal connection to Huntington's disease before I started at HDYO, but it's it's such an amazing community, so welcoming. And I love what you just said, because that's one of the things that I really enjoy seeing is that um, that barrier between research and science and then the community is completely broken down. Uh, so where you do have those abilities for the communities to come together and, and like you said, solve that problem, whether it's providing insight sites and telling stories or um, giving opinions and thoughts about how to better formulate the different protocols and pieces of clinical trials to just meeting each other so scientists can get inspired by these family stories to continue to work so so tirelessly like you all do um to to find a solution for this find treatments and and be able to support the community so i agree with all of that love it um and it is such a unique community um especially in our diseases well we there's a lot of interesting stuff as you said happening in the world of research and science and we wanted to talk specifically about something that is known as somatic expansion or somatic instability. And that's a really, really interesting topic because it can relate to a new concept of HD research and focus. But I wanted to just kind of level set to just remind everybody a little bit about the basics of genetics when it comes to Huntington's disease. So could one of you talk a little bit about the genetics of Huntington's disease, including the CAG repeat, how it's passed on, just so we can kind of get a base understanding. Yeah, I'm happy to get us started here and then Rachel can fill in what I've missed. It's definitely mutual when we work together on, on bug articles. Um, so, what I where I usually start is just to to really go back to the the DNA RNA protein, which you might have learned in in middle school, and how our DNA is made up of thousands and thousands and millions of nucleotides. Um, and nucleotides are the pieces of DNA that we represent with letters A, C, T, and G. Everybody in the world has, uh, you know, we have tens of thousands of genes. Um, one gene causes Huntington's disease. We call that gene Huntington, very creative. Um, and in that gene, there are these repeating stretches of the letter C-A-G. Um, so C-A-G creates a certain type of a, a section of a protein, but uh, C-A-G happens within, the, within this gene and it repeats over and over. And, you know, lots of, everybody has these repeating C-A-G segments. The average amount uh, in the population is around 20. Um, but what we know is that when there's too many of these CAG repeats, that leads to Huntington's disease. Mm -hmm. um, so usually we'll say it's you know more than 40 will lead to Huntington's disease within a person's lifetime, but there are sort of gray areas in there as well. So somebody with 35 or more might end up developing it. Um, but in general, what we know is that you know, CAGs lead to Huntington's disease when there are too many of them. Yeah, I think the thing to jump in next on this is the other thing that makes Huntington's disease kind of interestingly, interesting genetically, and probably why many folks might have already known about it from like a genetics 101 course that you took um, in college, is because of the way that it's inherited. So it's not just the CAG number, it's about um, the, the how you inherit the disease from either your mom or your dad. So we nearly for, for all genes we actually have two copies um, and most genetic diseases 
you need something to be faulty in both copies of your gene in order to get the disease. Um, and that's because it's something termed recessive. That's the like fancy science genetics word that people use for that. Um, but Huntington's disease is very unusual um, um, as a rare disease because it actually is a what we call a dominant inheritance. So it means that you only actually need one copy of your Huntington gene to have too many CAGs, as Leora just described, and you'll have Huntington's disease. Um, and what this means is that if you have one parent who has Huntington's, then all of the kids from that parent have a 50-50 chance um, of inheriting it. And that's why, you know, most of us are aware that within families affected by Huntington's disease, it's, you know, it can, it's usually around 50% on average, but you can have, you know, uh, you know, maybe 40 or 60% of family members through that inheritance line affected by Huntington's disease and that's why it has such a big impact on the families who have to cope with this. Yeah, I think it's it's that's a very interesting piece because you do see families where you have many children who are gene carriers somewhere it's not carried, it's not passed on at all. So it does seem really challenging. And I think it's it's important for the community to really listen to what was just said about that it's a 50% chance for every child. It is not a mathematical equation regarding the number of children and estimating um, the number of people who will become gene carriers. So I think sometimes that's a big misconception is having that conversation yeah. of, well, my brother is gene negative, so I must be gene positive, or I look more like one parent who is gene positive that I must be, I must inherit that gene because I tend to look like that person. So I think it's important to really understand that it has to do way deeper than that and that it is truly a 50% chance of being passed on per child. Yeah, every every time it's essentially a toss of the coin, is it heads or tails? It's, that's how it works. So yeah, you're exactly right to point that out. Right. Well, let's 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 break down a little bit more about this latest article when we talk about somatic expansion or instability. Um, this is a pretty new term for the community. So can we just talk a little bit about what the concept is about that instability or expansion? Do you want to get us started this time, Rachel? Sure, I can get us started. Um, OK, so um, we've actually known for quite a long time now that um, the CAG number that people are diagnosed with in their blood tests in some cells in your body, actually, that number doesn't stay the same. Um, and, uh, you know, this is, I think, going back to studies in like the 90s and so not long after the Huntington gene was identified. Um, people were looking at brain samples and other kind of tissues from folks who had HD, and they were able to make this observation that in um, some types of cells and some types of tissues, over time, it seemed like the CAG number itself is getting longer and longer. Um, and it's important to note that this is like in a subpopulation of cells. So this is not every cell in your body. So your CAG number that you're diagnosed with is still accurate for nearly but, you know, as far as we know, most of the cells in your body. But there was this interesting observation that it seemed that this was getting longer and longer over time. And so it was quite puzzling to think about, well, why is this happening? And, you know, is this something that just is correlated with disease or is this something that's like happening and maybe contributing to the mechanisms of the disease? Like that's what people have been trying to figure out for a long time. Um, and uh, another observation that happened is um, people, you know, with the advent of being able to sequence people's genomes much more easily um, and do all kinds of other genetic studies, um, we started to look at other genetic factors that might influence Huntington's disease itself. And so most folks will be familiar with the fact that the longer your CAG number on average, the earlier your symptoms will begin. But actually, there's huge variation. Um, within the most common CAG numbers. And it can be plus minus like 15 or 20 years as to when you might start getting symptoms. So there's obviously other factors beyond just the CAG number that are affecting um, how folks experience the disease and their disease path. Um, and so what we were able to do as scientists, not me personally, but some very, very clever people who all work together in this big international team, uh, this big consortium of scientists, which was really amazing. They came together and they looked at, okay, what are the other genetic variations that happen 
in people with Huntington's disease? And are there some of those that are associated with earlier and some that maybe are associated with later onset of symptoms? And what we call those is genetic modifiers. So these genetic modifiers change the, at the time at which you would start symptoms with the same CAG number. And so this is just like, this was a revolution in trying to understand how Huntington's disease works. Um, and what they found was that nearly all of these genetic modifiers are in um, genes which are involved in a process called DNA damage repair. And so immediately when this paper came out, people started getting really excited because they thought, oh, maybe there's a link between the way that um, the DNA expands over time and then all these DNA repair proteins that people have discovered in these genetic studies. Um, and uh, since that study has been done, there's now pretty conclusive evidence that these proteins that are involved in DNA repair are actually the proteins that are contributing to how our CAG number expands in these subpopulations of cells in the brain. And there's even more evidence recently that actually the cells that are expanding the most are the ones that are the most vulnerable um, in people with HD. So um, another cell type that we, we talk about quite a lot in Huntington's disease, you know, we know that the part of the brain called the striatum is most affected, but there's a specific type of cell called a medium spiny neuron or an MSN for short, which seems to be like the most vulnerable. And those are the cells that die the earliest um, and um, seems to be contributing to Huntington's disease the most. Um, and it seems that those cells are the ones that have the largest expansions. So at the moment, I mean, it's still a hypothesis, but the idea is that actually this CAG expansion is what's driving disease um, in Huntington's. And the CAG you need to get over a threshold of CAGs to get the disease, but then it kind of gets exacerbated by the fact that your CAG number gets longer over time. Mm -hmm. uh, Leora, I'm going to hand it over to you. Is there anything that I missed or need to explain you, better? I think you've told the uh, a lot of the story. And I know that, you know, Jenna had some some questions um, in terms of, you know, specific things that folks in the community might have asked yeah. or maybe... Mm -hmm. Uh, maybe we can just sort of clarify within that. Yeah, that was a lot of information very quickly. Yeah. So. <laughs> no, I think it's really great. And it's interesting. It. Yeah. Well, and I think it's great to know that it's it's a great reiteration for the community too. It's because while it might be new to the community, it's not something that was just discovered overnight too, is that this is something oh, that yeah. takes years and years, decades in order to determine and the complexities of that um, in order to, to find a viable hypothesis at the end of the day exactly. to hopefully then yeah. study further into it. Yep. Yeah. Absolutely. I am a little bit curious um, and, think, and maybe this is jumping a little bit too down the line, but thinking of what developing a treatment to target this expansion, this particular gene that you're mentioning, is it something that, and, and you may have already stated this, but I just want to clarify, is that you have a CAG repeat of 40, let's say, and your protein, your um, the CAG repeat is expanding um, even further past that. So then that way the onset of symptoms are happening. If you were to take away that expansion, you would still be a gene carrier and could develop the disease, but it wouldn't be as quickly or as early. So by targeting this, you would elongate the time before symptoms would eventually happen and maybe suppress some of those symptoms so they wouldn't be as bad. Is that a fair assessment? Yes, that has been the, the hypothesis. So I think, you know, our, our DNA is sort of constantly getting pelted with environmental things and stuff inside the cell. And, you know, we talk about antioxidants, all these kinds of things that are, um, that are damaging our DNA. And so there's just this whole uh, set of uh, equipment that our cells have for repairing that. And sometimes, you know, it's running along these DNA stretches of letters and finds like, oh no, there's this very long CAG repeat here. Um, and it tries to kind of fix fix it, but then it accidentally ends up adding more and more inside of that cell, right? And so one of the, the things that researchers are really excited about is because we know that this very particular part of the brain, the striatum, has been affected for such a long time. Um, we've, you know, we've known that since doctors started 
looking at human brains um, post-mortem in, in like the 1800s. And we knew that there was this one part of the brain that was affected. And we knew that Huntington's disease, you know, involved mood and movement and, and motivation and memory. Um, and that part of the brain is involved. But we were never really quite sure why is it those kinds of cells? And there have been recent technological advances that have been able to show us that oh, that's where those repeats are getting longer and longer. And that's a very recent discovery that people are excited about. And the other thing that people are excited about in the science world is the fact that, you know, if you have this long repeat, some of those, those new technologies and these experiments have been able to, to show us that there's some threshold, right? So 40 or 45 repeats does, does something that causes them to get longer and then, you know, maybe they're just really quickly then starting to get longer and longer and longer in these cells. And that's what um, ends up, you know, leading these cells to get damaged and die. But it could be that we really have a very long time before that happens. And it's not this sort of like, oh, things are, are worsening slowly over time, but maybe that like it's suddenly, it's just this sudden fall off, right? So that's actually really exciting because it means that there's this potential, this potential to intervene mm -hmm. after those processes have happened in the brain. And so those, those are two things that you know, Rachel already mentioned, but mm -hmm. um, are things that it's just exciting to think about in terms of therapeutics. Mm -hmm. um, and now, so the machinery that causes, you know, that's getting tripped up on those CAG repeats is really what scientists are trying to target now it's what companies are interested in doing is kind of saying okay we know that there's this little subunit this little piece of the machinery that's part of how that dna mistake gets recognized and that's what's making the mistake so if we could block that from doing its job or if we could knock it out or just get rid of that protein then maybe it wouldn't happen so much and that is indeed what we're starting to see in cell models in animals and it's now that really that momentum is picking up to try and translate some of those into humans. Yeah, I think um, the experiments that Leora talks about there, where people are looking at these specific pieces of the machinery and how targeting those could be a good therapy. I mean, this is where the, the human genetics has been so powerful. And because we've been so fortunate that so many people in the HD community very graciously you know have donated blood and other tissues that allowed everyone to look at the genetics because when you've got so many thousands and thousands of samples you're able to see these small genetic signals um very clearly um but you need that many samples to see them and then when you look at these signals it's essentially like nature has already provided you a way to make hd better or to slow it down or to stop it happening as quickly right because we know that people who have mutations in some of these pieces of machinery, that means that those pieces of machinery don't work properly anymore. They're not getting Huntington's disease for, you know, X number of years after we would predict based on just their CAG number alone. So what we want to do with drugs is we want to mimic that genetic mutation that some people just happen to have through random chance. Um, we want to mimic that with a drug to kind of impair that piece of genetic machinery, uh, so DNA repair machinery, in the same way that those people with the mutation have it. Um, and that's really exciting. Um, and we hope, you know, that's basically what we're trying to replicate with the therapeutic strategies that everyone's thinking about is like, how can we replicate what the human genetics has already shown us is possible? So that's what's really um, compelling about this hypothesis is that there's a real there's a path to understanding how we could make things better because nature's already done the experiment for us. And I'm, I'm assuming that because this is something that um, not everybody has um, that's impacted by HD as far as this, the, as you say, the machinery that kind of makes this expansion happen at a quicker pace. And at what time, I'm assuming that there's no real known reason why or ability for people to go in and get tested at this point if they went to their neurologist, because I can just hear what people say to say, do I have, am I, do I have the somatic expansion? Do I have the gene that's causing this rapid expansion of the CAG repeat? Because I think that's a normal question for people to ask. 
Yeah, it's an absolutely normal question. I, and I think that somebody who is, obviously there are lots of folks who are not interested in having that mm -hmm. genetic information. And there are other folks who want as much as possible, mm -hmm. right? So right now in clinical practice, these are all research tools, right? There's things that you can discover in using data from many, many thousands of individuals, but the presence or absence of a mutation, a different mutation or a different piece of machinery or not, isn't really going to tell you a lot of information about yourself as an individual. So that's kind of a, a larger statistics question. Um, but geneticists and doctors at this point wouldn't go in and say, okay, I'm gonna look at your, your DNA repair machinery genes and that will let you know whether you have a chance of having later symptoms or earlier symptoms. That's not, that's not um, something that you could tell with an individual clinically. It's really uh, been a very useful research tool. But um, right now, these are just sort of terms and concepts and techniques that are gaining ground in the research world. And that participation has been extraordinary. But you wouldn't go to your doctor and say, hey, do I have a mutation in this, this gene? I think it's because they couldn't give you appropriate advice as well. So as Leora said, so just to reiterate this point, that if you even if you had the one of the mutations that's described in this study and you found that out, you know, your change in your predicted age of onset is still a statistical prediction as to whether you would be earlier or later, because we already know there are so many different things that can impact you know, when someone gets the disease, even with knowing their CAG number and even knowing these other genetic modifiers, there's still a variability. And the other problem is that some people will have lots of these genetic modifiers and all sorts of different things. And we currently don't have enough data on how that might interact altogether to change someone, predict someone's outcome. Um, and then there's environmental factors and all sorts of things that we still are trying to understand. So it would be in a, I think it would be inappropriate for any genetics um, service to give that information because we just don't know what to do with it yet. Um, mm -hmm. And it wouldn't maybe not be helpful. Um, and so I think that's why like no one should be offering that yet. And I don't mm -hmm. believe that they are. Um, and maybe, you know, but maybe 10, 20 years in the future, you know, we will do that, but it will be because we want to know which drug of the, you know, eight that or whatever that are in the clinic in the next five years would actually be the best for you to treat you. Um, and that kind of personalized like therapies is something that is very possible in the future. And that's exciting, but we're not quite there yet. Yeah. I wouldn't quote any researcher on any specific timeline ever. But um, yeah, we don't, this is all, it's very early days of mm -hmm. somatic instability. Even though we've kind of known about the phenomenon, we've made a lot of observations. We don't really know a lot about like what makes things expand at a certain rate or whether the CAG repeat is expanding in certain cells or in certain people in the same way or not. So it's, uh, these are all questions that we're trying to get these DNA repair researchers into. So often um, what's you know great about the HD research field is that there's fingers on the pulse of what's going on in the rest of the, the world and the rest of the world of science and trying to bring in that specific kind of expertise to HD. And we've seen quite a lot of that in this field in the last several years. Well, I think it should be exciting for the community to hear this um, for a lot of different reasons. And I think one of those is that there, I. I think there has been a big pressure to have that one treatment that's going to solve all the problems. And as you, as you mentioned, this could, this is going to hopefully be one piece of the puzzle to be able to have almost like a, a regimen of treatment to be able to, to tackle this disease in each, in each individual person, hopefully to help with the disease progression and slowing that down, but other avenues as well. So this is just another further understanding of what's happening, which I think is really exciting. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, some people, be, sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, we discussed, I think, um, when we were at a conference earlier this year, like Leora um, was talking to me about how, um, you know, we don't, we don't want to put all our eggs in one basket because that's where we can end up with really big disappointments. And um, we need to be trying as many things as possible um, and be led by the data. 
And I think here the data is very clear that this is, um, you know, hopefully a good strategy, but we need to keep, you know, keep our eyes open as to all kinds of different possibilities. Um, because we, we already know that, you know, the Huntington's disease um, patient community is not a monolith and people experience the disease quite differently in terms of like what, you know, which symptoms they have at different phases and all sorts of bits and pieces. And we're still trying to figure that out. Um, and so that means that we're probably going to need different treatment strategies, as you say, um, and maybe more personalized therapies. And I think we only have to look at cancer treatment. 15, 20 years ago to what cancer treatment is like now and see how personalized it is and how strategic it is to your type of cancer. It's no longer like, you know, here is buckets of chemotherapy and radiotherapy. It's very, it's often very precise now. Um, and the outcomes are now much better for patients. And so one day we'll get there with Huntington's as well, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. I also want to acknowledge that you know, something that I hear a lot from community members is, is just really how frustrating it is that we have this excitement around a particular new concept that could be applied to drug discovery. But the amount of time it takes to get that, get those discoveries into, to create medicines to bring to people to test in clinical trials, is a long time. And um, it's worth acknowledging that there's a lot of frustration there and that you know, as the the field has has sort of um, there's there's definitely some new thinking and some new ideas that were made possible from these large you know genetic databases and discoveries, um, and they are in the process of kind of being tested preclinically and moved into humans. Whereas there was a wave of Huntington lowering of this concept of like this is what's going to solve things. Um, and a lot of those are still really being tested in clinical trials. There's still a lot of hope there, but the kind of the stage that that's at in the pipeline is a little bit further along, which is why we were seeing all these clinical trials versus the somatic instability stuff, which is kind of like, okay, when's the, when's the trial happening? And, and the truth is that it's really still early stages kind of figuring out what do you, what is the thing, then what do you target it? then how do you make the drug that'll do that? And then how do you test that in cells and test that in animals and test that in people, right? So we're in that early part of the pipeline for a lot of these, but I will say that there are, really there are dozens of companies that are interested. And there are you know several that presented publicly at the CHDI conference last mm -hmm. April, this in April of 2023 in Dubrovnik, where they you know were publicly working on on uh, things to block some of that machinery that gets messed up that causes the yep. somatic expansion. So we're getting there, but it's different from having a phase three clinical trial happening. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think, you know, there's also the differences in technology, right? So when we first started thinking, you know, way back when about doing Huntington lowering, we had to spend a lot of time and effort being like, okay, well, how do we measure that Huntington is actually being lowered? And it took time to, you know, find what we call like biomarkers and develop the experiments that we needed to do to look at samples from patients to actually check the drugs doing what it's meant to be doing and that we can see Huntington levels go down. Um, and the problem with some of the somatic instability stuff is that, you know, I think we still haven't quite figured out, even if we had like the best looking drug ever and it works really well in cells and mice, how do we test it in people and know what we're going to be looking for? Because, you know, we talk about somatic expansion and somatic instability, but it's a really slow process um, at certain stages of the disease. So you're getting maybe in some cells, one extra CAG per year is kind of the average assumption from some genetic studies. So how do you measure that? And, you know, that's happening in the brain. So how do we measure those changes that are happening in the brain? Like, is there another way that we can read that out? Um, and, you know, these things are happening very slowly. So it's kind of hard to know if you've actually slowed them down or if they've stopped at all or what's happening. So we've still got a lot of work to do on that front. Um, and I think that's going to be a challenge. But as Leora said, there's like an unbelievable number of like extremely smart people and like very committed companies who are all working on this and trying to tackle this. Like I was just at a workshop 
run by the Hereditary Disease Foundation on somatic instability. And that was amazing um, to hear so many different people's point of views. And they brought everyone together to like hash out all of these kind of problems and try and think about ways that we can overcome them and bring people together to try and work together to to solve some of these issues. So it's moving forward, but it's, it is going to take some time. Um, I think one of the things that we're quite lucky about in Huntington's disease is that the disease is rare, but not too rare. And it's also a very clean patient population. So we know exactly who does and who doesn't have Huntington's. Um, and so that means that, as Leora said, all these biotechnology companies who've been making all this like really fancy uh, cutting edge genetic technologies and DNA editing systems and all sorts of stuff. They all want to work on Huntington's because it's a really well organized patient group. People are really engaged in research and clinical trials. And so, you know, if we're going to get one of these, you know, super duper technologies to work, it will probably be in Huntington's at some stage, which is really amazing. So that's something that I'm very hopeful about. Is there room, obviously there's a lot of complications with something like this, but is there room in your opinion um, to make this an opportunity for people with juvenile onset HD, knowing that the disease is a, for JOHD is a faster progressing disease. So if there is this instability, it would be able to be detected quicker because I know that population is really eager to have research focusing on how they can um, suppress or lengthen uh, or what have you with these children who are who are who are going through this really terrible ordeal. That's a tough question. I think in general, when companies sponsor research studies, they mm -hmm. tend to begin with adults, especially with an adult disease. Um, but I do think that the field is shifting towards thinking about how do you take this younger? How do you take mm -hmm. this before disease begins? And there are researchers who have implied that it is uh, going to be really important to start treating people far, far long before their symptoms occur. So hopefully, you know, in future, there'll be reason to test early and reason to try and give treatments that prevent things. I will say that it's likely that any treatments for Huntington's disease will start to be tested um, in adults first, just mm -hmm. truthfully, that is, that is how uh, companies tend to approach this. However, the, I, it's hard to express how, how valuable those, those tissues are and those participants are. And so any type of observational research in which juvenile Huntington's patients can participate is is just extremely valuable right because if we can learn this you know if this is, is happening faster if this is really the mechanism that's contributing to to juvenile onset um, with somatic instability expanding much earlier then we'll need to know that from from those brain tissues, from those blood samples, from you know perhaps samples of, of liver um, that can be donated, right? So I don't, you know, I don't want to. Um, I no researcher wants to make any promises, right? It's likely mm -hmm. that that adults adult testing and clinic will come first, um, but certainly every company in this space who thinks about having a product, you know, a drug product. They think very deeply many years in advance about all the different trials that they would plan out and how do you how do you involve that youth community, how you involve kids earlier, um, because there's a need there too. So, um, you know, every company I've spoken to has a plan for if this works, how do you quickly test what's next earlier on? Yeah, great. Thanks for that. Um, well, I think it's it's also important to one quick thing. Uh, we've talked a lot about the different timelines and the intricate nature of um, finding the hypothesis, then moving that into cell samples and animals, and hopefully moving into a clinical trial. We do have a video at HDYO as a part of our breaking down barriers called an insight into drug development and clinical trials. And so that's a really great place to get a quick snapshot of the complexities and the different stages that um, these companies do go through and these preclinical research phases moving into the next stages and then hopefully into the clinical trial capacity. So that's a great thing to refresh yourselves on. Um, and I think it's, it's 
it, it, as Leroy said, it does get frustrating when you're looking at the timeline that these things take in order to um, get into clinical trials and the time for the clinical trials themselves and the amount of um, of contributions that it takes from the community is is incredibly, incredibly essential and important. But there is that, some frustration around it. But I'm hopeful that because of the amount of companies who are investing and more clinical trials that are coming in and more ideas of, of how to treat this, whether it's Huntington lowering gene therapy, mRNA splicing, so many different, um, so many different concepts to, is it a safe, efficacious, is it, um, is it something that is reasonable for the community to participate in, in order to hopefully have a therapy that is readily available uh, to the community is, is, is just really exciting to be able to see th these many companies invested, these many different concepts of how to treat this disease. Uh, and, and so I think it's important to kind of put all of this together in this one research realm and understand that true investment of the research community, but then also acknowledge the tremendous investment that the community has in the research as well. Absolutely. Any last thoughts from you two before we wrap up? I would like to say that I think um, it's it's been very exciting to see this concept gain ground and to see how over the years the when you go to different scientific conferences to see how the thinking is sort of starting to shift in different ways and how different layers of research are being added onto this field and this one really does have momentum it really does and um, it could you know the some of the thinking about this can represent a real major paradigm shift. You know, so I've heard one of the researchers who's really well known in this field present it, and it's it's you know it's very new and different for a lot of scientists who are are uh, have really thought a certain way about Huntington's disease for a long time. And he likes to say, this is Dr. Steve McCarroll of um, Harvard Mass General. He likes to say, take this idea out for coffee. <laughs> so we'll reiterate that here and say that that's what researchers do. You know, they come together to share their ideas. They take them out for coffee. And then, you know, if if things go well on the coffee date, then they keep exploring. So um, there's lots of great minds working on this and many other avenues of research as well. So rest assured that there are lots of smart, compassionate people out there who are in this with you. Absolutely. And I think, um, you know, something that you hear a lot at these conferences is that, you know, Huntington's disease is one of the most complicated monogenic illnesses that exist. Right. So by that, I mean, we have, you know, this one mutation that we know causes Huntington's disease, but understanding the underlying biology has proven to be exceptionally difficult and complicated. Um, and some of that has been sort of bogged down with maybe not using the right models to try and understand things um, and all sorts of different things. But the, I think the reason that, as Leora mentions, like people are so compelled by this is because it's driven by human data from people with Huntington's disease. Like that is the underlying basis for all of this work. Um, and we so we know that there's a really good chance that this is going to pan out in the future because you know, we've we've already seen this experiment happen genetically in people. Um, and so that gives me a lot of hope that we just need to find the right strategy and the right way to make this into a drug and the right way to measure that it's working and it's not doing anything we don't want it to um, and that it's going to help people. But it's a it's a very exciting time. And, you know, as I mentioned, there are meetings all year where people are getting together to try and figure all this stuff out and share their data and move things forward as quickly as possible. And uh, yeah, people are working very, very hard to try and understand this and get a drug to the clinic as soon as possible. Yeah, that's fantastic. It It is really an exciting time in, in Huntington's disease research when you look at all those different varying factors. And uh, we're excited to be able to follow along through HD Buzz, 
by um, for those who are watching this, make sure you do follow along at HD Buzz, take a look at your local association, sign up for their newsletters, go to events, listen to research talks, um, look at the trial finders through HDSA and EHA and be able to stay abreast to the many things that, that are coming down the pipeline and how that could affect you or your loved ones or just to be able to become empowered through that educational piece. Um, but thank you both very much for your time today for sharing um, about somatic instability, as well as um, all the work that you do with your day to day lives, helping communicate with HD Buzz tirelessly presenting many different times throughout the year. We really appreciate all of your hard work. Thank you so much for having us. Yeah, it's been lovely. Thank you. Absolutely. Well, thank you all so much. And uh, if you need any additional information, please hover, head over to hdyo.org. We're actually in the process of turning this article into a research video series that we do. So it will be available on social media soon as well in conjunction with this interview. And um, we hope you all stay well and we'll see you soon.